So I'm going to talk to you. We talked earlier today about finding prospects and inviting those prospects to take a look. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a short course, about 10, 15 minutes each on the remaining five skills. Some basic direction for you to be able to improve, get better, take your business to the next level. Presenting. She talked about doing PBRs, and PBRs are a way of presenting, yes? But I want to give you some framework in order for you to feel strong about what you need to do in, pre in presentation. First is your story. We talked about story. Every one of you needs to get solid on your story, not only with you, but everybody on your team. Okay? We don't need to talk about that again. We got that. Story's number one. And in story, I just want to say the different places to use it. Use it in that PBR. Use it on a three-way phone call. Use that story in Facebook Messenger. Use that story on social media. That story needs to be everywhere. The whole world needs to know that story. So story's number one. Number two in presenting is to use tools and events. Third party many times is better than first party. For your prospects, for you to put people in front of a video instead of you giving the facts, sometimes has more credibility. If you put somebody on the phone with somebody else or if you bring somebody to an event like this or, or a local event, let the event do the work for you at the beginning let the tool do the work for you. You get more leverage using tools and events. Uh, events are highly effective because relationships change when you're face to face. There's social proof. There's all kinds of good things that happen at an event. But sometimes they're more difficult to get people to invite and show up. So tools, you can scale. I remember the first tool that I was introduced to. My company came out with a video cassette. They sold it for like 15 bucks. They had a bunch of celebrities on it. and It was cool, man. They did the presentation. And I started off in my career originally inviting people to an event. And letting the event do the work. And then the, the company came out with a tool and I'm like, whoa, that means I can have an event happen any minute of the day, 24 hours a day. So the, the, the videotapes were $15 a piece. I bought a hundred of them for $1,500 and I started to go out and I went to a person and said, hey, I learned how to properly pass out a tool. And I learned that if I said, please watch my video, nobody would ever watch. So I, I learned how to effectively invite somebody by essentially, I'll give you the short course on it. If I gave you this videotape that has all this information, life-changing information on it, and you could watch it at your convenience and it'd take you about 40 minutes. If I gave you this videotape, would you watch it? I'm not saying I will, but if I did, would you watch it? They say yes. When could you see it for sure? Oh, I could see it by tomorrow night. All right, fantastic. So if I called you after tomorrow night, you'll see it for sure, right? Yeah. All right, what's the best number and time for me to call? 10 a.m. cell phone. All right, fantastic. Here it is. I learned how to do that effectively and then to follow up professionally. And now I had a hundred meetings happening. If I was effective in getting people to watch, it's like, holy moly, the leverage I could get from that. Now today we have, you can click a link and have a meeting happening. Can't you? Either a live Zoom call or something recorded, a webinar recorded, or some static tool that your company video, et cetera, that you could play your team, a, a, a recording of your team meeting or something that you could play. Yeah? yeah? But 
there's something that's happened. Now we get more scale with a link because I can text you a link. And hey, if I text you a link, would you watch it? When would you watch it for sure? So if I called you after that, you'll watch it for sure, right? What's the best number and time for me to call? All right, here's the link. Bloop. Now, first of all, almost nobody does that. They just send the link to everybody. Say, please watch, please watch, please watch, please watch. Difference between amateur and professional. Just a few words change your results completely. But in addition to that, a link is, even though it's fast, it's cheap. When it was tangible, physical, I gave somebody something, they could hold it, it had, it weighed something. It had a little bit more value in the person's mind. When it's just a link in their, on their, a text message or something on their phone, it doesn't have the same kind of value. So it takes a skill set in order to get people to value it, which means you don't need to send the link until they've already agreed for sure that they will watch and they give you a time. You cannot send the link without doing that. Okay? So the world, everybody wants to take a shortcut. Copy, paste, send a, a, a thousand people the link. Please watch my video. And they wonder why everybody runs away. Just, it's a few more words. It's like, you know, 40 more words to totally change your life. But you need to go through them. So I miss the physical, tangible. And I understand that we have scale, but... Many of the companies that I consult with and I talk with, I, I coach them to create a tangible in addition to the digital. So there's something with weight to leave behind. There's something to send home. There's something in addition that just adds some credibility. So all of this stuff. You're going to use tools and you're going to use events and you're going to use electronic tools as well as physical tools. All that stuff's fine. But here's what I got to tell you. This will work and it will help you grow and it will help you build a business even if you don't have a lot of skill. But at some point in the presentation part of your skill, and please make this note, you need to learn how to say the words yourself. You can't just push play forever and to be an influencer. You can't just drag people to meetings forever and be an influencer. At some point, you've got to say the words. Maybe not for your prospects, but for your team, for their prospects. You've got to learn how to effectively communicate the vision of your product, the vision of your opportunity, the vision of your company. You have to. It's got to come out of your voice. You hear what I'm saying? It'll change your life and it'll scare you to death all at the same time. Speaking scares people. It scared me growing up. I remember, you know, when you had speech class in high school and everybody had to give a speech. And I remember because I was a W last name, I was one of the last ones to do it. And I was terrified for three days. The countdown, watching meltdown after meltdown, or great person after great person was even worse. But counting down the days until I had to do it, oh God, somebody kill me. So, when I got involved in network marketing, what changed everything for me is somebody told me the person with the marker makes the money. And I went, huh, okay, I guess I got to go get that marker. I guess I got to get up in front of the room. I guess I got to do it. So the first thing I'm going to encourage all of you to learn is your basic opportunity presentation. Do you say it? Let me tell you about our company. Let me tell you about our products. Let me tell you about our compensation structure. Let me tell you about the support that's involved if you decide to 
join us and let me tell you about the timing that you're faced with at this moment. And here's the call to action. Let me help you make a decision. Learning how to say those words. I learned how to say those words pretty early when it came to the opportunity presentation. After I learned the story, every one of you needs to become good at it. If you're on Jesse Lee's team, it's really easy to say, just watch her videos. I don't need to do it. But you will never be the leader that you're supposed to be unless you do. So I learned to do the presentation. It scared me to death. The first one, I, I wish I had a video of it. It's so, it was so awful. I stood up, my mind left my body. It's like, ah, ah, ah. It was awful. But I learned from it. I got better the next time. And then I got better the next time. And pretty soon, I was one of the best people in my city. If somebody heard that I was doing the presentation at a local opportunity meet, they brought more guests. And what, you know what that did for my team? My team went, that's our leader. That's our guy. Our, my team started to perform. I started to have influence with my team because I earned their respect by me doing something that I was uncomfortable doing. So I earned their respect and people started to pay attention. People started to listen. And my team started to say, hey, can you come do a presentation at my house? so I could come to their house and say the words. Would you get on this call so I could, conference call we're gonna do with the team, so I could say the words for them? And they edified this whole structure. I was like, wow, okay. So I learned how to do this and it built, it's not just about ego, it's about effective leadership because if you do it and you communicate well, people will respond and they'll perform for you, not for you, for themselves, but because of you. Next, I learned how to do a getting started training, a basic training, just a, how to join and get going. Step one, step two, step three, step four, how to get some results, how to get moving. We're going to talk about that in a bit. I learned how to do that and I learned how to make it really, really tight and strong. And pretty soon everybody was saying, hey, will you sit down with my team and help me get them going? Fantastic. Then I learned how to do more skill training. If we did a super Saturday, I could do more on a super Saturday. And then ultimately, I learned all of the skills and I learned how to do a keynote, a keynote talk. Anybody ever listen to that talk I did when I was 29 years old? Have you ever heard that talk? Way back in the day, whatever it was, 94, something like that. I did this little talk when I was 29 years old. My voice does not sound like my voice today at all. I listened to it. I'm like, who's that? It was a different person. But let me tell you what happened the day after that talk. My team was proud. I was a recruiting tool just as much as the product was. I was a recruiting tool just as much as the, comp as the compensation plan. Eventually, you've got to say the words. Now, if you want to be a top-level influencer, when it comes to the presentation skill, you learn your story, and you teach other people to do the same thing. You learn your opportunity presentation, you teach other people to do the same thing. You learn getting started training, you learn all the skills, you learn eventually to do a keynote. If your company, listen to me, you want to be an influencer? If your company calls you and gives you 30 days notice to do a 12 minute speech at the company convention, you need to be ready. I got 90 days notice when I was 29 years old and I worked my butt off for 90 days to be ready for the moment. Changed my whole life. That 12 minutes changed my whole life. 12 minutes changed everything. It built something in me to go, you know what? I'm enough. I've got this. 
If my team right now is not willing to perform, I'll find somebody else. Doesn't matter. I can make this happen. It built a confidence in me that I didn't really have in any other form. Now, if you want to measure your influence, you need to measure because we live in a, a, a world of bits and bytes. And those bits and bytes, I've got to tell you, are not enough to grow true influence. You can't just send the link around the world. Some of you are great presenters. Incredible, amazing. But here's the question. How many on your team are amazing? How many people on your team are currently capable of doing an amazing opportunity presentation? How many people on your team are currently capable of doing a getting started training? Or did they just play the video? Or did they just invite somebody to somebody else's Zoom? Are there like eight presenters in your whole company? And because of that, it's just the same eight revolving on the different Zoom calls and everybody plugs in. How deep is your presenter skill set? I work with different people around the world. I coach different leaders around the world. And one of the things that I teach them to do is put together a, presenta a presentation school in every major market. Find one person, if you have one amazing person in your city, have that person take inventory. Who in that city would like to become a great presenter? Come to my house every Monday night. We're going to work together for three hours in a safe environment. Ten weeks from now, you're going to leave here as a graduate, being ready to take on the world, do a presentation in any, anywhere you want to do it. If you want to measure true influence, measure how many people can say the words in your team. It's critically important. Okay? It's not enough to just push the push play. It's not enough to send the email. You've got to learn to say the words and drive it deep. This is a big measurement. So presenting. After presenting, skill number four is following up. Most people don't join after one presentation. Hey, here's my product. Most people don't join right away. Hey, here's a business. If you, you know, join my business. Most people don't start a business after one conversation. We assume that they will because maybe some of us did. But most people are like, I got, you know, I've got some questions. I got to think about it. Some people just need some time. All kinds of different things. So just... Always be assumptive, like, of course, you're probably going to want to join and come do something with me because you're a smart person, and together we can do something amazing. But also, don't be stunned if they say, I need a little time to think about it. Don't be freaked out if they say, I got to talk to my spouse. Don't be sad or frustrated if they say, I don't think I have the time or I'm not sure if I have the money. It's normal. Here's, what, here's your job in follow-up. Remember I said all business is conversation? Here's what all follow-up is. You ready for your notes? All follow-up is, is keeping the conversation going. You have an exposure? Keep the conversation going. Open-ended. Don't close it. Set the next exposure. Keep the conversation going. Answer a question. Keep the conversation going. Have them try out your product or service. Keep the conversation going. Introduce them to somebody else. Keep the conversation going. Bring them to an event. Keep the conversation going. Send them a link. Keep the conversation going. Show, show them some positive news. Keeps the conversation going. That's all it is. An average person takes at least... I've said forever, four to six exposures before they're ready to make a business decision. Now, many of the products are just really easy to make a decision. Oh, this makes sense. I want it. Seems fairly priced. Give it to me. I'll take it. But to start a business, I've said for 30 years, four to six. I would say today it's probably more because it's so digital today. An exposure can be links and posts and all kinds of different stuff that doesn't have the same weight. It might be more. 
because we get bombarded with messages every single day, and this is just another message. So being patient and talking to enough people, having enough conversations going on, that you don't have too much pressure on any one of them. I mean, if you start a conversation with 100 people and you're just keeping them all going, your job is just don't end any of them. <laughs> Seriously. Don't end any of them. Just keep them all going. Well, I'm not, you know, I don't think it's for me. Well, before you totally make your decision, let me introduce you to somebody. Before you totally say no, at least try the product. You know? Come to this event. Check out this site. Whatever it happens to be, keep the thing going. Exposure to exposure to exposure to exposure. Here's the key. The only reason to have an exposure with a prospect is to schedule the next one. Your intent is to just keep the conversation going. That's the intent. You keep the intent there, everything else gets easy. There's no pressure. You don't have to worry about, oh, am I going to, when do I go in for the kill? Don't worry about that. Just keep the conversation going. Your job they say, well, I've got to think about it. Uh, schedule the next exposure before you finish this one. That's cool. You need to think about it. Fantastic. What do you need to think about mostly? Uh, I don't know, the compensation plan. All right, fantastic. If I sent you some information about it, if I sent you a video, if I introduced you to a friend, if I had somebody explain it for you, would that be helpful? Oh, yeah, that would be helpful. All right, fantastic. I'll send you that. How long do you think it'll take for you to kind of go through that material? Oh, I need like a week. All right. So if I called you a week and, you know, eight days from now, would that make sense? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Fantastic. What's the best time for me to call? Call me in the morning. Your cell phone? Perfect. 11 a.m. Next, next Tuesday. Does that, would that work for you? Yeah, that works for me. Fantastic. I'll send you the information. If you have any questions, give me a call. If not, I'll talk to you next Tuesday. Next exposure is set. And when you talk to them then, then they just say, I don't know, know about the ingredients in the product. Now, I'm not really sure about the ingredients in the product. Now, mind you, they haven't looked at the ingredients in any product for the last 22 years. <laughs> They're sipping their Diet Coke saying, I'm not sure about the ingredients in your product. <laughs> What's the sweetener you use? I mean, like, really? Come on. As they're going through Taco Bell. You know what I mean? But they're trying to sound smart. It's okay. It's natural. A lot of objections. Let me tell you about objections. In this exposure of keeping it going, keeping it going, keeping it going, keeping it going, objections are going to show up. They're going to show up. And stop being surprised because it's going to be a handful of the same ones for the next 50 years. They're not going to change. They haven't changed in the last 30. I can't expect that they're going to change much in the next 30. But let me tell you why. I've kind of analyzed why. Why is it? Number one, there comes a time in every presentation when a person goes, you know, a real business person would throw in an objection around now. Maybe I should do that just to sound smart. <laughs> Seriously. You know, you're presenting and they're going, hmm, hmm. Are you part of the Better Business Bureau? <laughs> um, what's your scientific advisory board look like? You know, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> They'll ask all kinds of crazy stuff just to sound smart. Sometimes it's just a reflex. You know? You ever walk into a retail store and you need to find something and you don't know where it is in the store and the person comes up and says, can I help you find something? You lie. No, 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 I'm just looking. The professional understands. They back away and they wait. If you need anything, just let me know. All right, thanks, thanks. Yeah, leave me alone. Three minutes later, they can't find their size. <laughs> Professionals like, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, yeah, show me this thing. So they're just reflex. Some people say, hey, would you like an opportunity to make money? Their reflex is, ah, money? What are you talking about? I'm good, I'm cool. 
Sometimes they just need clarity. They're seeking clarity. They're not looking for a fight. They're seeking clarity. They're like, uh, is this one of those things? I had a friend of mine say, is this one of those pyramid? Did you work, you work with those pyramid things. He saw the look on my face. He says, I don't mean anything negative by it. <laughs> because how do you clarify what this is that we do? You say it's network marketing. People say, oh, computers. Nice. <laughs> right? It's crazy. So objections are natural. And let me tell you one thing. Objections are your best friend. Without them, you will not build rapport. Without them, you will not build certainty in the prospect's mind, clarity in their minds, understanding. They won't, the prospect, the, the objection itself helps to educate them. It helps them see a picture. You want them to ask the question. I don't think I have the time. <gasps> I used to be terrified by objections. I used to be just terrified. I hated them so much. I hated him like I hated lima beans. You know what I mean? I still hate lima beans. But a person would come up with an objection. I'm just like, oh, I thought I had a good person. Then they said, I don't have the time. I'm like, Pfft. so you know what I did? I ran away. Some will, some won't. So what next? I'm gone. I don't have the time. I'm going to go find some people who have some time. Bye. I don't have the money. I'm going to go look for people who aren't broke. Bye. I ran away. I bought their story. In every conversation, somebody's buying and somebody's selling. And they sold me that they didn't have the time and I ran away. They sold me that I didn't, they didn't have the money and I ran away. They sold me. It wasn't for them and I ran away. I got sold. So at first I ran away. Second thing I did is I fought everybody. Once I got a little in education, information, people say, you know what, I just don't have the time. Oh, you're you know how many hours there are in a week? Are you, when are you gonna stop wasting time watching television and scrolling, scrolling on the internet? When are you gonna take charge of your life and walk away from all those other distractions and do something for real? I, I would say these words. How do you think it worked out? <laughs> then I'd get, I'd get really, really defensive about network marketing. Oof. Is this one of those pyramid things? I'd say, oh yeah? Like everything in the world, like the government, like every sports team, like every company? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Yikes. I tried the cute ones. No, it's not a pyramid. Those are in Egypt. I tried that. Didn't work out very well. I'd win the argument, lose a prospect, but I'd win the argument. I can win a debate about network marketing. You can't win with me. I'm going to win. But I wouldn't get, get any progress. And then I finally learned how professionals dealt with it. If there's anything you wanna try and figure out, just go find five or 10 people inside the profession that are amazing at it, interview them, find out what they do, do that. That's what I did. Did you know there's only two kinds of objections in network marketing, just two? One is a limiting belief about the person. I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm not a salesperson. I'm too introverted, I don't like people. You know, all these limiting beliefs about themselves. I don't have the time, I don't have the money. That's just all limiting beliefs. Because if, if you really understood what this was, you'd find the time, you'd find the money. It's not that, that's not even real. It's just a limiting belief. Or they have a limiting belief about network marketing. You know, maybe they have a friend, they tried it, or somebody else in their family tried it, or. And, and, or they've heard bad press about it or whatever. They got this limiting belief about the, the profession itself. And so because of that, they just say, you know what? 
That's a filter, not for me. Fantastic, no problem. I used to hate it when somebody started judging network marketing because, I mean, I had my own insecurities already and they would just pile on. It was brutal. So I learned how to deal with objections. I'm going to give you a very simple process, four steps to dealing with any objection. Would you like to just be equipped to use an objection to your benefits? Yes. Yes. Number one, listen. Listen to what they're saying without talking, without interrupting them, without waiting for your, your turn to talk. Just listen until you really understand what they're, where they're coming from. Listen to what's going on. Listen to the inflection of how they're saying it. Listen until you fully understand. You might have to ask a few follow-up questions to fully understand what it is that there is the issue. Listen. Number two, relate. Relate to that person. Help them not feel like they're crazy. Person says, I don't have the time. You might ask a few questions about that and they tell you, you know, their story about not having much time. Then relate to them. And here's what you do. You say, I had the same thought that you're having right now. When I first looked at this, I didn't think I had the time either. We're the same, you and me. They say, I'm just not sure about network marketing. I wasn't either. You have the same challenges I had. I don't sure, I'm not sure if I have the money to do this. This seems like a big decision. Me too. This was a big decision for me. Even though I was making enough to make a living, everybody thought I was okay. I still didn't have very much at the end of the month. And this was scary as far as an investment. I didn't want to be a loser and whatever. Whatever it happens to be, relate to them so they feel we're the same, you and me. Okay, listen, relate. Third is to tell stories, yours or others. Tell stories. I got this concept from an old Amway tape I listened to years ago. And the, the title of the tape was to build your rut and let other people see their own challenges in your story. You know, that there's a, you get stuck in a rut, build yours. And here's, here's what this means. Somebody says, I don't have the money. Don't say, yes, you do. You can figure this out. <laughs> or don't even give them advice. Because that's what we're, we're tempted to do. Let me tell you how to. You know, and now it's a talking down to them, subservient type of a situation. Here's a better way to do it. Tell a story, your story, if, it, if it's appropriate to you. Somebody says, I don't have the, oh, don't have the money. Say, I totally understand. I'm, we're the same, you and me. When I first looked at this, I barely had enough to keep the wolves away from the door. I was already freaked out about what was going on at work. I had credit card debt. I had student loans. I had these different situations. Nobody else knew that I had these financial struggles, but I had them. And when I looked at the $1,000 it was going to take for me to be a part of this, it scared me a little bit. And I wondered if it was a worthwhile investment to add to the stress that I already had in my life. But let me tell you what I realized. At this stage of my life, if $1,000 was going to make me nervous, I bought the wrong plan. I was stuck in the wrong situation. I've been, I've been helping other people get rich for too long. So I just knew that for things to change, I had to change. I had to look at things different. I had to decide to invest in me instead of investing my time and my life in others. So I made the decision to get creative and resourceful. And I found the $1,000, even though it scared me a little bit. And you know what that $1,000 turned into, into for me? It was a symbol of my commitment to change my life. I decided that I was going to make that change. And I could do it. And I just had to say no to a few things and say yes to my future. So that's my story. 
Now, I didn't say one thing about them. I said it all about me. And then it's just a quick step number four. If I would you. If I could show you how I got creative to figure out the $1,000, even though it scared me at first, and it was the best decision I ever made, if I showed you how I did that, the decisions I made and the lessons I learned, if I could show you that, would you be willing at least to take a look at it? Understand what I did? The answer is almost always, 99% of the time, it's going to be, sure, show me. You could do the same thing with time. I don't have, have the time. Me either. I was freaking out about time. I had work pressure. I had home pressure. I didn't have any time for myself. The kids were pulling at me. I had to do this and I had to do that. And to think about, I'm going to start a new business and try and carve out 10 or 15 or 20 hours. Oh, it freaked me out to even think about it. It wasn't the money. It was the time. But then I realized, I realized that if I didn't control my life at this stage of my life, was I ever going to with this plan? I took a look at this and I realized I might have to make some sacrifices to make the time work in the short term. And it might even be less comfortable today. But five years from today, I'll buy my time back. Five years from today, I'll have more choices. Five years today, I'll, I'll have more freedom. Because if I don't have time now, if I keep doing what I've been doing, I'm never going to have time. So time's our freedom, right? I want to be able to enjoy that. So if I could show you how I got creative to figure out the time and why it was worth it for me, would you be willing to take the next step with me? Yeah, sure. See what I mean? And it's the same four steps with any objection. And in that, you build rapport. Now, one quick thing I'll give you on network marketing haters. Anybody have a network marketing hater? I love network marketing haters so much. I wish, like the biggest critic in the world, most educated, sharpest person you could find. My dream is to go on live television with that person, like on the halftime of the Super Bowl. And just have a discussion. That's my dream. Or on YouTube or anything, anywhere, anytime. But they always run away. I've tried for 10 years, every single one, all the big names, I've tried every single one. And they just like, no, they don't want me messing up their deal. Um, but somebody comes to you and says, ah, oh, network marketing, stop talking. This conversation is over. Is this one of those things, pyramid deals? Are you about to go to jail? You ever get those? Here's my process with those. I love those. Oh, if you have any, send them to me, please. It's the greatest conversation ever. But here's the conversation. You just go, stop, 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 stop. You've got a story. What happened? Was it you? Was it somebody in your family? You can't have this kind of emotion unless you got a really good story. So forget about my, my opportunity right now. I don't even care about that. Tell me your story. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Tell me. <laughs> what was your company? Do you still have some product in the garage? What happened? <laughs> tell me, I gotta know. That's why your car is pink. I get it. No, 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 no. It's a great company, fine company, unbelievable company. So, I love that. And they, and they usually say, no, 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 I just don't like it. Oh, I said, come on. I'm not, I'm not trying to sign you up. I just got to know. When was it? When did it happen? And they finally, they, they usually just drop. They just, seven years ago. My brother-in-law got me into this stupid thing. I told everybody. Signed up a whole bunch of people, and then the company went out of business. Oh. I'm so sorry to hear that. 
That had to be bad. You put your reputation on the line with all these people. They followed because of you. They joined because of you and your recommendation. Then the company went out of business. Oh, man. What, what, how did you deal with it? And they tell me their story. I've, I've heard all these stories, all of them. And I empathize with them. I'm really sorry that that happened. But let me ask you a question. Was it network marketing that let you down or was it that particular situation? Yeah. They say, you know what? Because companies go out of business, right? In every, every field, every day. This one was a little more personal because you were recommending it. I get it. And they, they usually admit it wasn't network marketing. And then say, you know, let me ask you this. And I'm not saying you have to. And I understand the pain and I understand the reputation. I get it. But if you, if you could ever feel comfortable that the company was going to be around for the long term, if they were solid, if they were real lifers and they were doing it right and you felt confident in the security of a long-term thing, is there ever a situation where you might consider getting involved again? If you were comfortable. And almost always, almost 100% of the time, they'll say, yep, sure. Sometimes it's I got in and my upline pushed me around and bullied me. And they told me I had to do this and I had to do that. And I finally got sick of it. Then I would say, do you think it was network marketing that let you down? It was at that upline that was pushing you around with their out of control ego. Yeah, it was the upline. If you could, let me ask you this, if you felt comfortable that an upline situation was never going to be that and you could be the, what you wanted to be, was there ever a chance, ever a situation where you take another look? Answers, of course. Whatever it would happen to be. Here's what I know about somebody that hates network marketing and says never, ever, ever again. They're going to join again. <laughs> it's in the blood. You're going to die with it in your blood. And it's either going to be finished business or unfinished business. One of the two. You're going to live with your results or you're going to live with your regrets. One of the two. How many people in this room at some point tried network marketing and said, never, ever, ever under any circumstance, don't talk to me. I'm not doing it. Raise your hands, please. And here you are. So, find somebody in network mark some, that hates network marketing. They're one of your best prospects. They're, they're joining again. It's going to happen. You say, I was burned out. Whatever. It's code words for all kinds of things. So, does that help a little bit? Follow up and keep the conversation going. Objections, just a simple formula. Listen, relate. Tell stories, ask questions. One thing about stories, sometimes your story might not be appropriate. They say, it's not a good time now because I'm eight months pregnant. You can say, oh my gosh, me too. You can't say that. <laughs> Especially if you're a guy, that's a problem. And please don't ever say, oh, I know exactly how you feel. No, avoid that conversation. But what you can do is tell somebody else's story. You say, I totally get it. I understand. You got a lot of stuff going on. But, but your story reminds me of somebody on the team that just decided that they wanted to start their business and extend their family at the same time. Even though it was crazy timing, they decided to do it too. And here's why they did this, 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 this. And if I could show, if I could in maybe even introduce you to that person and they could tell you their story of how they did it, would it be a conversation you'd want to have? Sure. If you say, you know, a person says, oh, it's really challenging for me. I can't do it because I'm a brain surgeon. Me too. You can't do that. Me too. <laughs> But you can point to other doctors and physicians within your organization, somebody who, who can relate to their story. 
So it's your story or somebody else's stories, but stories are very, very powerful. Listen, relate, tell stories, ask the question. The ultimate question in network marketing is, if I, would you? It is the most powerful question you could put in your arsenal. If I, would you? If I gave you this link, would you watch? If I told you this story, would you listen? If I invited you to this event, would you attend? It's, it works on about 15 psychological levels. It is thermonuclear. It is amazing to help a person move forward when their instincts are to be frozen. Keep the conversation going. So.